in uh, Eisenhower's speech, he read a telegram that surprised you. Hmm. What was that? Well, he read one that didn't surprise me. It was from Art Summerfield, the chairman of the National Committee, because I'd heard from a lot of them after the speech myself, and the telegram indicated that they were unanimously in favor of my staying on the ticket. After all, they weren't <laughs> stupid. After they heard the public reaction, they followed what the public wanted, or seemed to want. Uh, but the other one was one that, that he read from my mother. It was the first one that he re read, and I uh, must say it was a rather moving experience for me to hear it. Would he did not show it to me beforehand. So you were hearing it for the first time? Oh, yes. I have a copy. Would you read it? It reads, uh, Dear General, I am trusting that the absolute truth may come out concerning this attack on Richard. She always called me Richard, never did. And when it does, I am sure you will be guided right in your decision to place implicit faith in his integrity and honesty. Best wishes from one who has known Richard longer than anyone else, his mother. Well, Bill Rogers later told me that he was enormously impressed with the fact that my mother had written that out herself and that it was done so well, so tersely, and so eloquently. Uh, but my mother was quite a person, too. There's a famous photograph. Uh, Incidentally, my father, I think, would have said something else because he, he was sort of had. I remember that after this fun thing was all over, uh, he put it in his own rather terse way. He says, well, it looks like the Democrats have given themselves a good kick in the seat of the pants. <laughs> There's a famous photograph taken at the Wheeling rally after all the speeches and all the, uh, the emotions of that week. Uh, as you were shaking hands with a group of people, you saw uh, Bill Noland and uh, your California Senate colleague and friend. And when you came to him, you, uh, you just uh, broke down and, and uh, he put a comforting hand around you. The, did you. Did you feel bad that having stood up as tough as you had for throughout the whole crisis, that at the end you, you let yourself go? Yes, I have always sort of prided myself on uh, self-control. Uh, and uh, I am emotional, uh, but I don't believe you should share emotions. I am a great believer in privacy or expose them in the way I know that, you're, that uh, all in the political science classes and the rest these days, you not only expose your emotions, but you're supposed to put them on to convince people that you're human and all that sort of thing. Uh, but in this case, I guess what happened is that uh, uh, I had never had uh, an emotional uh, downturn or outbreak or anything. I hadn't let it get away with me during the critical days when I was trying to make the decision. But once you have fought the battle, and once you have won, then you have a letdown. And Bill Nolan came up to me and he said, great speech, Dick. And all of a sudden it all came down on me and I got over it pretty fast, though. What, what lessons did you draw from your experience in the, in the fund crisis? In, in your memoirs, uh, or sorry, in Six Crises, you wrote, I had been deserted by so many I had thought were friends, but who had panicked in battle when the first shots were fired. Well, what you learn in any time you come under an attack is who your friends are and who they aren't. Uh, I mentioned some of those that did uh, write and wire me before the broadcast. After the broadcast, everybody did. Uh, but before the broadcast, there were a lot of people that jumped ship, people that I thought were my friends. Uh, I also realized uh, after this broadcast uh, and after the fund crisis was over uh, that uh, in politics, uh, and I think I had known this before, but I realized it even more, uh, that you cannot expect others to save you. Uh, you've got to save yourself. Uh, I, didn't, I don't resent the fact, when I, in retrospect, that Eisenhower said, look, it's not my decision, it's yours. After all, he's the commander of this outfit, as Bert Andrews said to me after uh, he heard that I might uh, uh, resign from the ticket uh, since I hadn't heard from Eisenhower. And uh, he had the right uh, to uh, call the shots the way he wanted. I remember Bert Andrews put it very on a telephone with me very well. He said, look, he's the man who commanded five million troops in Europe. 
Uh, he's the nominee for president. He's going to be the next president of the United States. He's going to make the right decision, but he's going to make it in his own way and at the right time. You know what the decision is going to be. It's going to be favorable. The broadcast decided that, but don't try to second guess him. Uh, I realized that that was the case, and I realized that from now on, that's the way Eisenhower was going to run his presidency. What was your opinion of Adlai Stevenson? Not high. Uh, I guess that's no surprise to our audience, and I know that <laughs> his opinion of me was perhaps lower. Uh, I respected him as one who had been successful enough to be nominated for President of the United States. Uh, but he had a, a superficial, fatuous air about him that just turned me off. It turned many on. The media loved him because the media loves froth. Uh, they like fashion. Uh, they like the titillating humor that he used, even though he used to laugh at his own jokes. Uh, he, he was one who, uh, I think Oscar Wilde put it once, uh, like the man who knew the price of everything and the value of nothing. Uh, what concerned me most about Adlai Stevenson, however, was the fact that I thought he would be a disaster as president. Not because of what he believed, because I wasn't sure what he believed. I think that he would believe whatever was in fashion. I don't think he had profound beliefs. But because of his indecisiveness, he had a Hamlet-like quality. Uh, Bill Rogers, I think, summed it up very well. He said that where Stevenson was concerned, that he considered everything very carefully before making the wrong decision. And that is a man we don't need in the White House. I always felt that, and so I could campaign with him with good conscience and with great verve. Incidentally, Eisenhower shared that. Eisenhower couldn't stand Stevenson. Uh, for example, in his eight years as president, Eisenhower never had Stevenson to the White House uh, and turned down a suggestion on one occasion that Foster Dulles uh, made that he should be brought to the White House for purposes of enlisting Stevenson for a bipartisan support of Eisenhower's foreign policy. Uh, the same was true of Harry Truman. Let me explain. Eisenhower was not a hater, but on the other hand, he could not take personal affronts. I mean, I've taken stuff that people have hit me and smash me, and you go out and you meet them again and all that sort of thing. Uh, you forgive. Uh, although you may not forget. But Eisenhower, if people attacked him personally, uh, just couldn't take it. And Harry Truman, of course, had suggested that Eisenhower run as a Democrat in 1948, and then took him on unmercifully in 1952, said he didn't know more, any more about politics than a pig does about Sunday, and that Eisenhower some way had been involved in the decisions with, that divided Europe at Yalta and that sort of thing of course, was not true. He never forgave Truman, never allowed Truman in the White House. But incidentally, getting back to Stevenson, I remember that <clears throat> after Eisenhower had his heart attack, uh, that uh, his doctors told uh, Sherman Adams, they said, don't raise Stevenson's name with him. It raises his blood pressure. From 1946 uh, until um, 1957, Joseph McCarthy represented uh, Wisconsin in the United States Senate. Today, McCarthyism has become sort of a, uh, uh, a catch-all epithet. What, how would you define McCarthyism? Well, first, in order to understand McCarthyism, you've got to really go back to the Hiss case. Uh, the reason the Hiss case sent the establishment right up the wall was that up to that time, those that talked about communism in America were considered to be nuts uh, or demagogues or worse. Uh, there were several reasons for that. Uh, they said first that uh, as far as Hiss was concerned, uh, that uh, he was probably telling the truth, uh, that he was not a communist, uh, even after the evidence became overwhelming, that he was or at least uh, that he had served the communist purpose. Uh, uh, second, there were those that said, well, even uh, though he might have been uh, a communist and turned over papers, secret papers, documents, and so forth, as he did in great volume to 
communist espionage uh, agents, it didn't make any difference because one, the papers weren't important, even though they weren't declassified, even at the point that ten years later. Uh, or second, and this was uh, really distorted reasoning, because the Soviet Union had been our ally. They overlooked the point that Hiss remained a communist at the time that Chambers left the Communist Party during the period of Hitler-Stalin pact, when certainly you couldn't say that Stalin and communism was an ally of the United States. And then third, there was a deeper reason. Uh, it had to do with the fact that people thought that the Hiss case uh, and the investigation of Hiss and his eventual conviction uh, reflected on a whole generation of people uh, that had supported the Roosevelt foreign policy. I never forget an evening in Washington when one of these Washington hostesses, uh, not in the great tradition of Germain de Stahl and the others who had their salons back in the 19th century and the 18th century, who used to get people together for serious talk, uh, but in the tradition of getting controversial people together in a room to see what fireworks would happen, uh, but in this case, one of the guests was Paul Porter, uh, a Washington lawyer, a very good lawyer, uh, a Democrat, a liberal, and I was there with him. Uh, and the Hiss case, this is right after Hiss uh, had admitted that he knew Chambers, after first denying that he had known him, uh, and after the evidence was overwhelming that he was uh, not only a communist but had delivered papers uh, to a, a communist espionage agent. And I remember Paul Porter got red in the face and he pounded the table. This is at the conclusion of dinner. He says, I don't give a damn if his admits he was a communist or whether he was. These investigations are doing a great deal of damage to the country because they reflect on the Roosevelt foreign policy. Well, now, that was simply ridiculous. I was a supporter of the Roosevelt foreign policy. I was a supporter of the Marshall Plan. I was a supporter of this was later on, which was a continuation of the rest. I was a bipartisan supporter. But here it was, the attitude of this whole generation of people who had a vested interest in opposing anybody uh, who was exposed to communists. I think uh, since we only have a couple of minutes, we should probably cut now. Okay, we're going to stop tape here. We'll take a quick, uh, lunch break, 40 minutes, 45 minutes. Hyannis, and that's really surprising. And Joe Kennedy was a great supporter of the of his. Yeah. Of course, they're trying to. Me looking at it or looking at the president? Just picking up the questioning. Introduce me when you're finished. I'll just. Uh, uh, what do you want to? Yeah, I'll just uh, I'll pick it up. You want me to? You know what I mean. We were talking about history. Yes. Do you want to just start? I haven't quite finished. Yeah. <coughs> you You've said that to understand. Mac well, I'll say that you said mm -hmm. that to understand McCarthy, you have to that understand that his. Yeah, we right. said that earlier. But you can ask the same question, right. and you can. You're going to be sure. cutting anyway. You've said that to understand Joe <coughs> McCarthy, you have to understand the Hiss case. Well, up until the Hiss case, uh, as I think I was trying to point out earlier, uh, it was said that those who were engaged in the fight against communism in the United States were either demagogues or reckless or worse. Uh, after the Hiss case, they couldn't say that anymore because 
it was clearly demonstrated there that Hiss not only was a communist, uh, but that he was in a high place in government. He was at Yalta, for example, with Roosevelt, uh, and had been the Secretary General of the UN Conference in San Francisco. But in addition to that, that he had turned over top secret information to a Soviet espionage agent. And so under the circumstances then, they could no longer brush off communism and government as being a red herring or what have you. That's why Truman went forward with the loyalty program uh, after the Hiss case uh, came to public attention, even though Truman even called the Hiss investigation a red herring right to the last because he thought it was more political than anything else. Uh, and that, of course, led to McCarthy. McCarthy, in the first instance, uh, was not one who held himself out to be or was an expert on communism in the United States or abroad, for that matter. Uh, he was a Wisconsin progressive, uh, so to speak. He was one, for example, in 1952 who supported Harold Stassen uh, for, uh, I'm sorry, he was one who had supported uh, Harold, Harold Stassen for president in 1948. As did you, didn't you? As, as I did, that's right. And uh, did you we worked then? together. Oh, yes, we worked together uh, at that convention. I was not a delegate, but I was there as a congressman. And I remember, I remember Joe McCarthy so well, vividly. Uh, after it was clear that Stassen wasn't going to make it, it was quite clear even before he got there, but then when the die was cast and it was going to be Dewey, uh, I remember him standing outside the convention hall and the sweat just pouring down his cheeks and everything and is just shaking his head because he was a fighter. He said, well, if he isn't going to make it, we're all going to have to be for Dewey. And he wasn't enthusiastic for Dewey. He was more <laughs> curious enough for Taft than for Dewey, although he came from the Wisconsin progressive background. But coming back to how he got into the communist business, at 48, it was not then. But after the Hiss case, uh, a lot of politicians saw that uh, uh, from a political standpoint, there were gold in those hills, as they might put it, and also from the standpoint of the country that it was a legitimate issue and we ought to root the communists out of government if there were more there and expose those that had been there in the past. So McCarthy made his famous speech in West Virginia. I think it was in Wheeling, West Virginia, as a matter of fact. Uh, and in that speech, this is in 1951, uh, I was in California at the time and read it with great trepidation in the papers when I noted he was said that there were 56, I think that was the number, but it's irrelevant. He changed the number about every other day thereafter, usually upping it. 56 card-carrying members of the Communist Party in the State Department. I saw that and I practically threw up my hands because first I knew very well, apart from the fact that there might be and probably were, and I'm convinced there were, uh, some with communist sympathies in the State Department, uh, that under no circumstances would a card-carrying co communist be in the State Department uh, because the Soviet espionage uh, apparat doesn't put card carriers in a position where they can be exposed. They would be covert communists, for example, as Hist was. Hist was not a card carrier. Uh, at least he didn't have a card. He paid dues, but he did not. Uh, was not an open communist, so to speak. So under the circumstances, when McCarthy called me after that speech and asked me if I could furnish some information about what our investigations had showed, I said I'd be glad to help him. But I said, I urged him strongly, I said, you, you'd better get off this wicket and make it clear that you're talking about those who may have communist backgrounds, who had been in communist fronts or supported uh, the, the, the Communist Party in various ways, for example. And I said, there you'll be on safer ground because I think you're, I don't think you're going to be able to prove that there were card-carrying uh, communists in the State Department. Joe was never one to back off. That was his problem. Now, in the first instance, then, I think he saw the communism and government issue as a political issue only. But I will say, and I, I believe this to be true, that he was totally sincere about it and became convinced uh, that he, that it was a real problem once he dug into it, uh, because there were facts there, not the way that he presented it. He overstated it. He was reckless. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, he was on to something, uh, and those who were supporting the communists knew it, uh, and so did the political opposition. You uh, came to, bro to break with him in a very spectacular way in 1954. 
how did how did you get the news that you were going to be the man to jettison Joe McCarthy? Well, what had happened there was that all through 1953, after McCarthy was reelected to the Senate in 1952, uh, McCarthy was uh, expanding his charges. He first, in 1952, had uh, con condemned the previous Democratic administrations uh, by the term 20 years of treason. Uh, and then in 1954... And did you approve of that? Absolutely not. Uh, did you try uh, to, to uh, uh, On the contrary, Bill Nolan and I both made it clear, I on one occasion and Bill Nolan on another, that there was only one party of treason in the United States, was the Communist Party. And it wasn't the party that was involved. Uh, and here, Joe again was overstating. But be that as it may, uh, in 1954, after he became dissatisfied with what he considered to be the Eisenhower administration's failure vigorously to pursue the loyalty program of rooting him out from the State Department and other areas and so forth, he made a speech saying uh, that, uh, that there were 21 years of treason. That included the Eisenhower administration. Well, that was enough for Eisenhower. Eisenhower was already turned off on McCarthy for a variety of reasons. First, he didn't like his manner. Uh, McCarthy was a very physical, a vigorous uh, kind of a fellow that pat you on the back. Uh, and he was a very familiar person, familiar with Eisenhower or anybody else, and Eisenhower didn't like that. Uh, the second thing, he didn't like the fact that McCarthy had attacked George Marshall, whom uh, Eisenhower venerated. Uh, the third thing, uh, he felt that, I, that McCarthy, by his charges, was diverting attention from the accomplishments of the Eisenhower administration, uh, the Eisenhower crusade. Uh, and he didn't want the country debating that issue rather than addressing what he was trying to accomplish, ending the war in Korea and then moving forward with our various uh, domestic initiatives. Uh, and finally, uh, he felt that uh, uh, McCarthy, uh, as he often put it to me, that uh, rather than proceeding as I had in the his case, in a way that Eisenhower described as being objective and fair uh, and so forth, that McCarthy was swinging wildly and that he was uh, therefore doing more harm to the cause than good. Uh, those were the reasons. Wasn't it cynical to have waited until McCarthy began to attack the Republican administration to uh, to stop him uh, than to than to do it earlier when he was he was just as irresponsible. Well, let me say that it wasn't that cynical because McCarthy had not become that big an issue. Uh, it wasn't necessary to address it, uh, and we also have to have in mind too uh, that uh, uh, in that period of 1953, before McCarthy went over the brink and took on. Uh, the Eisenhower administration as well as previous administrations, uh, that in that period, I, uh, McCarthy, we all had to uh, admit, had great public support. A poll taken, the Gallup poll in January of 1954 indicated 52 percent for McCarthy and uh, only about 30 percent against. Well, it was pretty hard to take that on unless you had sound grounds. And so Eisenhower, though, who uh, like so many others uh, in positions of leadership, uh, has always followed the uh, motto, never make any mistake in a hurry. Uh, he waited, but once he made his decision, uh, then he decided that somebody had to answer McCarthy. The reason that I was chosen was that Adlai Stevenson had not only attacked McCarthy and indicated that Eisenhower was pussyfooting about the issue and so forth, uh, and also attacked Eisenhower for his foreign policy and defense policy and the rest, uh, he'd done it before a cheering partisan audience, and we had, of course, uh, equal time, or we're going to get it from the networks for that, and he had to select somebody to appear on it. And I remember so vividly uh, a meeting of the legislative leaders when the decision had to be made as to who had to appear, and there's somebody suggested the national chairman might do it. And no, that wouldn't do it. He wouldn't get it across. And somebody suggested the majority leader, and Eisenhower looked across the table. He says, you know, I think we ought to use Dick a little more. He said, after all, he knows this issue. Nobody can, can, uh, can charge him with being a pinko, uh, and therefore he's the one to address it. Well, <laughs> I wasn't about to be eager to address the issue. After all, uh, a lot of my friends were McCarthy's friends and so forth. Uh, I had just come back from a very successful trip to the Far East uh, in which I got, even from the antagonistic press, rather high marks, or 
uh, including a very favorable article in the New York Times at the conclusion. Uh, and uh, to get back into the partisan uh, business of having to not only take on McCarthy, but to divide the Republicans didn't appeal to me at all. But Eisenhower asked me to do it, and I did do it. On uh, March 13th, uh, 1954, you made this That's the speech. Uh, speech. Uh, I don't think you ever mentioned him by name, but it was quite clear who you were talking about. We have a clip from that speech. This administration recognizes the right and responsibility of congressional committees to investigate in the field of communist infiltration in the government. But we also insist that the procedures used both by the executive branch of the government and by legislative committees must at all times be fair and proper. A lot of people may raise the question, why all this hullabaloo about being fair, particularly when the people you're investigating are a bunch of traitors? In fact, I've heard some people even say, after all, they're a bunch of rats. Why don't we go out and shoot them? Well, I agree that the communists are rats. But on the other hand, remember this. When you go out to shoot rats, you've got to shoot straight. Because when you shoot wildly, it makes it easier for the rats to get away. And also, there's a risk that you might shoot someone else who's out there trying to shoot the rats, too. I remember that speech well. Incidentally, uh, I have never seen this film before because I don't watch myself on television. Uh, as I look at that, and I'm sure as others look at it, they'll think I must be reading from a teleprompter. But I've never used a teleprompter in all my life. What happened there is I wrote the entire speech out. Uh, I went over to the Carlton Hotel, I remember, rented a room, locked myself in for three days, uh, and uh, wrote it. Uh, they got it all in my mind and delivered it just like that, straight into the camera. Uh, Eisenhower, incidentally, after the speech was very, very nice. He called me from Camp David and he said, you know, I am not one who believes that you ought to butter up your uh, people. Uh, but he said, I thought that was a, a really an outstanding job. Uh, Eisenhower, in that respect, incidentally, was like my old coach in college, Chief Newman. Uh, the chief was a great coach and a great leader of men. Uh, but when somebody made a spectacular play and when he was being taken out of the game after the play, uh, most coaches go up and throw their arms around him and clap him, him on the back and so forth. And the chief just sat there, stoic inch in the ne Indian that he was, and never went up and congratulated him. And somebody asked him, why don't you do it, Chief? Uh, and he said, look, he said he was doing his job. And also, there were a lot of blockers out there that made that run possible. Uh, Eisenhower felt that I was doing my job. Uh, and you don't congratulate people or even thank them for doing the job they were supposed to do, although Eisenhower was usually very generous in a very personal way as he was there. But in any event, that particular section about the rats uh, had a great, great impact. How I didn't did you, mention McCarthy. How did you choose that language? Why did you choose that language? Well, I was just trying to think of a way to get it across. Uh, and it just came to me as I was writing. Uh, the idea, they're all a bunch of rats. I must have seen it in some speech that somebody made or heard it on the, on the Senate floor or something like that. And then I began to try to formulate in a way that people could understand. And uh, uh, in saying that, of course, I did not mention McCarthy by name, but I was referring to anybody uh, who was investigating communists, uh, that it was very important uh, to bend over backward to be absolutely accurate, uh, because otherwise uh, you're going to hurt uh, innocent people, but beyond that you may take on people as McCarthy did. He'd taken on Eisenhower himself uh, when he shot wildly, which was wrong. Do you think innocent people were hurt by McCarthy? Uh, relatively few. Uh, that's been greatly exaggerated. Uh, they mentioned Owen Lattimore, uh, people like that. Uh, let me say that as far as Owen Lattimore was concerned, even his apologists have got to agree that Owen Lattimore uh, was way over on the left, uh, and whether knowingly or otherwise, uh, that he more th often than not supported the communist side. Owen Lattimore is one of the more uh, prominent examples, though. Didn't McCarthy uh, recklessly in hearings just list, uh, come out with lists of names of people, not necessarily accusing them, but in the context of that time, even to be mentioned by him was enough to cause yes. great hurt and harm and even ruin careers generally, and lives. Generally, however, let me say, 
it wasn't the naming of names. Uh, if, if that was the case, whoever was named had an opportunity to come back. But it was the general way that he did it. Like he said, there are 57 card-carrying communists in the State Department. Well, he, he never named any names, but the point is that raised a cloud over the whole darn State Department, and that is something uh, that was totally wrong. I remember one name in particular that he mentioned. It, it indicates where he did have an innocent man. Uh, he was uh, raising hell about Bill Bundy, uh, Bill Bundy, who now I believe is the Carnegie Foundation of International Peace. But in any event, Bill Bundy was then with the CIA. He is, uh, was a brother of McGeorge Bundy, who later became Kennedy's uh, national security advisor. Uh, and uh, he uh, was going to have a Senate investigation of the CIA because Bill Bundy had contributed $500 to the Hiss Defense Fund. I remember Alan Dulles came around after an NSC meeting one day and asked me for, as a personal favor if I couldn't stop him uh, because he said, you know, we can't have the CIA investigated. And he said, you have seen, as I had Bill Bundy at some of our meetings, and he's just not a communist. I said, I know that. I know that. Uh, so I talked to Bill, and Bill said, but why did he contribute when I, I, after I had uh, when I taught Joe after that, Joe McCarthy? I got, got him off the Senate floor, and I said, I wish you'd lay off this. I think you should. I know Bundy. I've seen him, and I can vouch for him. But he said, why did he contribute to that traitor hiss? And I said, Joe, Bundy went to Harvard. Uh, and you know, everybody in Harvard since uh, that who was approached, or virtually everybody, to contribute to the Hiss Defense Fund, they support their own. Uh, I remember, for example, that President Conant, uh, who incidentally was uh, appointed to uh, go to Germany by Eisenhower and the McCarthy opposed, uh, was certainly uh, an anti-communist. But President Conant said that he couldn't possibly imagine how any member of the, of the Harvard faculty could be a communist. Uh, now, the point that I make is, was making to Joe was the fact that somebody had contributed to Hiss's defense fund when he had gone to Harvard uh, didn't indicate that that fellow himself uh, was a communist, because he just may have been mistaken. He may have contributed before Hiss was totally exposed. Well, in this case, my intervention with McCarthy worked. But uh, that is an example of an innocent person who was attacked because McCarthy had not done an adequate job of investigating. Do you think? Uh The image that people have of McCarthy as someone sort of uh, threatening and truculent, uh, what was he like personally? Uh, McCarthy personally was a very charismatic figure. Uh, I say charismatic because uh, uh, he, uh, he had a, a vigorous, magnetic personality. Uh, he had been a very successful candidate uh, in Wisconsin against a La Follette. And believe me, the La Follettes were very, very effective political properties in that state and in the nation over a long period of time. He had a strong handshake, and almost like a vice, as a matter of fact. He was a very, very strong man. Uh, he had a marvelous sense of humor. Uh, he was an interesting man to sit around and talk to, not about communism, but about things generally. Uh, he was a great ladies' man. Uh, my goodness, you, the around that Senate, I'm telling you, the secretaries and the rest were panting to go out with Joe McCarthy because, of course, he was a bachelor uh, for most of the years, at least, that I knew him. Uh, and, of course, as you know, uh, he was a great favorite of the Kennedys. Uh, went out with one of the Kennedy sisters, used to spend time at Ihannisport, play and touch football and the rest. Uh, so he was an attractive personality personally. Uh, he was, however, uh, one who, when you got down, uh, to a serious discussion uh, of an issue that required very, very careful investigation to avoid doing harm to, in, uh, to innocent people. Because charging somebody of being a communist in this period when the Russians were uh, basically our enemies in the Cold War, it was indeed a very serious thing. Uh, and in that respect, uh, McCarthy lacked judgment uh, and was subject to criticism. And unfortunately, I was the one that had to carry the message. In terms of the civilized uh, fabric of American society, did Joe McCarthy do more harm than good? I know that that is a proposition uh, 
th that is generally accepted, uh, I think, by most uh, observers in this country. Uh, I would have to question it. I, I think that in terms of the individuals, uh, as it finally turned out, uh, that I cannot, uh, I cannot name uh, the individuals who were harmed. Uh, as I say, some certainly had the potential of being harmed and so forth. Uh, however, I would say that McCarthy did more harm than good in a more general sense. He hurt the cause that he claimed to be serving. When one becomes the issue himself rather than the issue itself that he's trying to address, then he hurts that cause. And that's what McCarthy did. McCarthy became the issue rather than communism the issue. And all the work that we had done in the Hiss case, uh, for example, uh, after McCarthy, every time there was an investigation of communism, a legitimate investigation, people would shout and holler McCarthyism. So in that respect, he certainly did more harm than good. Incidentally, just to point it up, I, I'll never forget I was so, of course, honored to receive a wire from Herbert Hoover after the conviction of Alger Hiss. And he said, thanks to your efforts, as I recall it. Uh, the stream of treason in our government has finally been exposed for all to see. That was after the Hiss case. Then came McCarthy. He blurred the issue. He overstated it. By overstating it, uh, he injured the issue. And from that time on, uh, it became almost impossible to do effective work in investigating those who might be in that stream of treason. That's where he did the harm. Let me read you something that uh, Lillian Hellman, the playwright, wrote about the communist McCarthy and uh, the communist hunters, including Richard Nixon of the McCarthy era. She said, people would have a right to say that I, and many like me, took too long to see what was going on in the Soviet Union. But whatever our mistakes, I do not believe we did our country any harm, and I think they did. Do you think they did our country harm? Well, for her to say that uh, they did no harm is just fatuous nonsense, and she knows better because she from what I've heard, is an intelligent person. She's written, uh, the, whole, she's written the whole book called Scoundrel well, Time to say that, uh, I that know, that isn't a, the case. I know, a book very favorably reviewed, as we would expect, uh, from those that review books in the New York Review of Books and the other respected publications in this area. But let's look at the situation. Uh, when we look at harm in terms of the national security of this country, what about the secrets with regard to the development of atomic bombs? Now, sure, the Russians got one, uh, but they would have gotten it later had it not been, certainly, from the secrets they got not only from the Rosenbergs and others in the United States, but also uh, from the British group, uh, the McLean and Burgess and uh, the others uh, who were exposed and some of whom had, had, have, have admitted it. Uh, let's look, for example, at uh, uh, what has happened uh, just recently, to give you an example in a broader sense of what could happen, when they say that communists and government don't do any harm or communists, uh, that, that uh, it's just another idea and all that sort of thing, not to be concerned about, here we have Mitterrand in France, who has four communists in his cabinet having to uh, get to uh, send out of the country uh, 150 Soviet uh, diplomats. Uh, due to the fact that they were stealing uh, French technical material uh, that could be effective in helping the Soviet develop their military capabilities. Now let's look at the facts. The communists are engaged day after day in espionage. That's their business. It's a vocation for them. With us, uh, <laughs> espionage, and we engage in some too, is an avocation. With them, it is a policy. And there's no question that they're trying uh, desperately to get industrial secrets, technological secrets, and so forth. That's one side. Another side, I think, however, is even potentially uh, more profoundly uh, d uh, different and also uh, dangerous. And that is, if you can get someone who is under communist discipline uh, in a government position, he is able subtly to affect policy. And third, just to give an example, General MacArthur once told me, and this is now part of the historical record in any event, that he was confident 
that one of the reasons they suffered the losses they did when the Chinese attacked after he moved toward the Yalu was that there had been leaks uh, from uh, our side uh, to the Russians, which of course got to the Chinese, and that it cost American lives as a result. Uh, now what I'm talking about here are facts, uh, and I would say that as far as Ms. Hellman are concerned, uh, when she says that those that were members of the Communist Party, certainly maybe ones that were members as she was, a writer, uh, an, an unpopular idea, but we've got to accept that, that's one thing. I didn't bother me a bit. I don't care how many speeches they make, and, uh, whether in Hyde Park or or uh, out here in, uh, in New York City. Uh, but I care very much as to whether they're in government or whether they're in an industrial plant or what have you. Do we need a responsible McCarthy today to expose the amount of communist infiltration into government? I think we have now, and I would say this in both administrations, whether they were Democratic or Republican, I think there is awareness now in the country uh, as a result of Soviet, frankly, overplaying their hands, not only here but in France and England and, you know, uh, Sweden. There have been a number of instances uh, in which they've had to uh, throw out the Russians. Uh, I think that we have in the Justice Department and in the regular channels, uh, the FBI and so forth, uh, an adequate program of investigating and ferreting out these people. There was a time when we didn't have such an adequate program. Uh, after, the war, after, the, after the war, so forth, uh, World War II, uh, when uh, people uh, were, uh, had the naive belief uh, that these people were, were sort of obnoxious because of their ideas, uh, but we could afford to tolerate that, but they really weren't a danger to the country. They are a danger to the country, and they must be, of course, exposed, investigated, and so forth. I think it can be done, however, with the existing uh, government officials without having it done by somebody in the United States Senate. Do you think that there are moles, highly placed moles, in the State Department uh, today or, or in the CIA? Uh, I would be surprised if there were not. Uh, and I think that anybody in the position of power, be he a Democratic president or a Republican president or a Democratic Secretary of State or a Republican Secretary of State or head of the CIA, had better well assume that that might be the case. Uh, because when you look at how effectively they were in the government uh, in the World War II period and thereafter and before World War II, uh, here, Britain and the rest, and how nobody knew it, uh, let me say we got to be very sure that they're not there. So I would just assume there are, and that's why I think another reason why it's very necessary uh, to run a very tight shop in terms of revealing everything you know. Uh, because uh, unless you're very sure, uh, it may be sent right on to the enemy. How, how can one act on an assumption like that, though? Because if you, if, you, if you don't assume that you can't trust your closest friends and highest aides and closest colleagues, uh, how can anything get done? Well, first of all, your closest friends and highest aides and closest colleagues, uh, that's one thing. When we're talking about a mole, uh, I would seriously doubt uh, that one of those would be able to pass that kind of a test. At, uh, you mentioned before that you never look at yourself on television. Why is that? Uh, many years ago, I uh, always have to think historically, when I was a sophomore in high school, I had a marvelous teacher. Uh, they had a class called Oral English. I never took a, 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 a course, incidentally, in public speaking or political science. They didn't have any in Whittier College or in high school for that matter. But this was called Oral English. The teacher's name was H. Lynn Schuller, I remember. Uh, and uh, he had a very, for that period of time, a very unique way of teaching. Uh, that was a period when uh, the old style oratory, this was before the days of television, was very much in vogue. And you were supposed to know how to gesture and all that, and they taught that. And he didn't teach any. He said, look, speaking is conversation. Above everything else, be natural. Speak naturally. Don't use any gestures unless, you f unless it just comes naturally. Don't practice anything. Don't practice before a mirror because the most important thing in conversation is to be yourself, to be natural. And I knew from that day forward, and I believe even today, that it was best not to listen to myself on radio, 
not to watch myself on the television and the tape and so forth. Oh, I know it's, it's bad advice. Uh, I shouldn't be giving it to others because I know that most political people these days, they make a speech, they practice it in the television, they look at the tape, they get rid of the idiosyncrasies, the bad gestures and so forth and so on. But by the time they get through, it may be a superb performance, but over the long haul, in my view, it is not going to come through as effective. Now, I don't hold myself out as being the most effective person, but it is me, for whatever it's worth. And I'm sure that, it, that if you do look at yourself on television, you begin thinking of your image and how you are appearing, rather than in terms of what you really are. You've got to be yourself, and therefore, don't be too consumed by looking at yourself. Will you cross a room to turn a television set off if, if a s always, you come on? Always, I always on? do. No, I walk out. You do? I do, yes. I, I've never, I've watched these things today because we have to in, ever, in order to have the running commentary, but I haven't seen my acceptance speeches on television. I haven't seen my inaugurals on television. I have never seen the fun speech, not the whole thing on television, my resignation speech. Uh, and frankly, I don't intend to. I'm Except doing this. <laughs> I have to do it here now because uh, I understand we have to c make comments in the program. By uh, In other words, what I'm saying is, if uh, this may be helpful to some of our younger people who plan to be president someday or at least run for it, uh, that uh, or whatever, is the most important thing is not to be self-conscious. The moment you begin to practice in front of a mirror or watch yourself in the tube or listen to your voice, you're going to become artificial. You're going to become something that you really aren't. And uh, if you can't win it being what you are, you shouldn't win it. By, uh, along those lines, by the end of uh, uh, 1954 with uh, Joe McCarthy on the skids, you were pretty much installed as the bad guy of American politics. Uh, we have a, uh, a Herblock cartoon that appeared in the Washington Post that summed up a lot of the cartoons that uh, were done on you at the time. How did it feel to be arguably the most vilified man in American politics? Well, it didn't bother me that much, but believe me, it bothered the family. Uh, I say it didn't bother me because I thought that was just part of the price you had to pay. But you know, with our uh, youngsters growing up, and uh, uh, they learned to read at a fairly early age, and of course a Herblock cartoon you don't have to read, uh, and uh, seeing a man come out of a sewer, or what have you. Uh, but, uh, and uh, Mrs. Nixon was uh, greatly concerned about it, and she became more and more turned off by politics as to whether it was really worth it, because she had known uh, she was so magnificent on our trips abroad, you know. She, on one occasion, for example, on one of our trips, and this is hard for some people to believe, she used to go to hospitals while I would have, and uh, children's homes and orphans' homes and old folks' homes, et cetera, et cetera, schools, while I was having meetings with the VIPs and so forth. And one time in one country, she went to a leper colony and shook hands with lepers. And uh, it's the first time it had ever been done uh, by any visitor of that sort. It was safe, as she later pointed out. But having said that, she knew how hard we'd worked. She knew that, uh, that uh, under the circumstances, uh, that uh, we weren't getting any credit, credit for the positive thing and that uh, uh, Eisenhower was looking good, which she, had, which she loved, uh, but that as far as many on his staff were concerned, uh, they were blaming me for anything that went wrong that I was doing all the tough campaigning and uh, getting a lot of heat and very little credit. And uh, naturally, she didn't like that. And I must say, at times, bothered me, particularly when I got tired. Uh, you point out that from a very early time, Mrs. Nixon uh, really was a pioneer in terms of uh, doing things that uh, in, in prior administrations, the wife of a vice president would have gone mm -hmm. shopping while her husband was doing uh, things on, on official trips. And uh, in the White House, she had a very active, uh, she was a very active First Lady. That never came across, though, and indeed the, the, the uh, she was called Plastic Pat by in, in, in some of the press. Why do you think she was misunderstood in this way? Well, she was called Plastic Pat because she was my wife. Uh, if she had been the wife of a liberal, my God, they would have canonized her. 
but because she was my wife, they had to find ways to knock her. She never got any credit for uh, the things that she did, her foreign travels on her own. She went to Africa. Uh, she went on to earthquake zones in Peru and so forth and uh, did things that were uh, rather dangerous. Uh, she was active in the uh, programs for uh, bringing parks to the people, uh, for literacy, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, part of the reason, too, was that uh, she did not seek the publicity uh, and she didn't uh, really care whether or not she got it. But I must say, one of the reasons that she didn't receive it without any question was that uh, you can be sure that our friends in the media, uh, whoever they may be, <laughs> were not going to give her any credit if they thought it might help me. I understand that. That's part of the game. Not right, but that's the way the world, real world is, political world. How does that make you feel? Oh, I don't particularly like it, particularly where she's concerned, you know, because she did work so hard. But let me say, the American people are not stupid. It's quite remarkable, despite the fact that she has not had a particularly positive press, not nearly what she deserves, that, that she has been in the top ten of the most admired women for years after we even left Washington. The Good Housekeeping poll, for example, she has never been off of that. Uh, and the reason is that people remember her as being dignified. Uh, they remember her as one devoted to her family. Uh, they remember her, too, as one, uh, she may not have weared, worn designer gowns, but uh, she was blessed with natural beauty. She really didn't need them. What quality do you think of Mrs. Nixon as having that people would be most surprised if they knew but don't know about? Well, perhaps uh, a good sense of humor. She's fun, you know, she has a good time. Uh, she doesn't believe in, uh, however, in public demonstrations of, uh, of affection and that sort of thing. Uh, we never held hands in public. Uh, she isn't a public kisser, <laughs> I'm not either for that matter. Uh, and uh, and uh, I think another thing they might be surprised at, they shouldn't be, but they might be, is that she probably is one of the most intelligent women ever to have been First Lady. She had a remarkable, of course, uh, career in school, worked her way through college and through University of Southern California, uh, graduated with honors, taught for a couple of years. She's a very smart person. And uh, also the fact that in this political discussions, she uh, doesn't say much, but she can always go to the heart for matter. She's got a enormously good intuition. I think these are factors. The average person just thinks of her as somebody that went along for the ride and so forth, plastic pad as they called her, although I'm sure some of them didn't believe it. You see, when you, the people that give that kind of image are basically the women reporters. And, you know, we talk about men reporters, but the women reporters are more bitchy than the men. <laughs> and that isn't because they're women, but that's the way it is. Uh, I don't mean they're now, why, all that. Why is that the way it is? Well, <laughs> because basically uh, it, it is just natural for them to stick a needle in. Uh, and uh, uh, fortunately, I'm glad that after the beginning when they were giving Nancy Reagan hell, uh, that they're now beginning to see that uh, she's quite a person and giving her credit for what she's doing in the drug control and other areas. And she does deserve credit. In fact, uh, I can't think of any First Ladies who have, in recent times, who have gotten the approval that they should have gotten. Uh, Jackie Kennedy did because she was glamorous and cause, because she was married to Jack Kennedy. Uh, but uh, Mrs. Johnson didn't get the approval that she should have, and she worked her tail off in that job. Uh, I don't think that, uh, that, certainly that Mrs. Nixon did. Was Mrs. Nixon hurt by the lack of appreciation, not that she sought appreciation specifically, but by the lack of it can sometimes be hurt. No, I, I wouldn't say so. Uh, she, she was not surprised. You know, after all, we grew up very, very young. Uh, many of these people came into high office uh, without having really experienced uh, some of the tough times that we did. Uh, they hadn't gone through the terrible, brutal beating I took during the Hiss case, during the fund, uh, 
during the campaign of 54, 56, 58, 60s, uh, Caracas, and so forth and so on. Uh, she had uh, been through a lot, and so consequently, she rather expected things to be as they were. Uh, she expected them to be rather bad, and they were bad. Have, have you ever wished that you, after 1954, the 1954 elections, which we're about to uh, talk about, that were very bitter and brutal, and uh, that you didn't run again, that you had just retired and maybe moved back to California or New York and become a lawyer and spent some time with your family, with the girls as they were growing up, and with Mrs. Nixon? Not really. At the time, I felt that way, but, but, but that's one of the downers you have. You see, I, you, you got to understand that uh, I worked fairly hard. Uh, I didn't have a speechwriter, not in 52, not in 54, not in 56. I had help, uh, but I had to do the work. Uh, and uh, I worked long, long days and so forth. And at the end of a campaign, frankly, I was bushed. In the 54 campaign, I was out carrying the load. The Eisenhower cabinet was a non-political uh, cabinet, just like the Reagan cabinet, except, for example, for Mr. Watt. Uh, and so consequently, uh, somebody out had to be out there leading the charge, and I did it. And I was glad to do it. And Eisenhower, incidentally, was very appreciative of that. He wrote me at least three letters during that 54 campaign saying, I appreciate what you're doing. Do you have a lot of Beach Boys records at home? The Beach Boys. No, I don't follow that sort of thing. I, I've noticed there's some of the argument about it. But, do, you, uh, do, you do you think that uh, rock music? Do you think that Secretary Watt uh, is is a net minus or plus for the Reagan administration? <laughs> you know, I'm not even going to get into that. Uh, I uh, uh, all that I know is that uh, he is one who's making a lot of news. And, and of course, the problem is that poor Watt, he gets out there and leads the charge of defending Reagan, let Reagan be Reagan, and attacking the opposition, and he catches hell for it. So that makes all the rest of the cabinet gun shy. And the difficulty is that when the campaign comes along, here's Reagan going to have to do it by himself. Who's going to be out there taking on the opposition? Which is what you did for Eisenhower. That was my job, and I did it, and did it gladly, and I think I did it quite well. At least he thought so, which is the most important thing. And incidentally, I must say, in 1954, it was a tough campaign. 